This video is sponsored by Ratchet Clothing. Check out their latest creations. I'll put a link for their website down below in the description to this video. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the two times that the Grim Reaper came knocking at Stevie Crea's door. And by Grim Reaper, I'm not talking about Greg Scarpa. As I've previously mentioned, during the early 90s, the Lucchese family was in utter disarray. By May of 1990, the Lucchese bosses, Vicar Musso and Gaspipe Castle, would learn from a law enforcement source that they were ready to be indicted on the window case. The case revolved around replacement windows that were being installed all throughout New York City. And this project was put in motion by the New York City Housing Authority. And all five New York families had a piece of the action. They not only took control over $150 million in contracts, but were charging up to $2 for every replacement window. At the center stage of this scheme was the Lucchese family. And this was due to their control over local 580. 580 is an iron workers union. The indictment had 63 counts to illegally control the manufacturing of the windows and the installation. Extortion, labor payoffs, and money laundering were among some of the charges. There were 109 predicate acts charged to support the RICO indictment. Naturally, both Vic and Gaspipe were not going to wait around to get arrested. So they decided to lamb it and went into hiding. The significance of the boss of a family and his underboss becoming inactive put the family on unstable ground. Power of a family comes from the top, the administration. Although they're at the head of the family, the administration is also looked at as the foundation of the family. And like with any foundation, any cracks in it compromises the structure. Fully aware of this, the Lucchese bosses placed certain members in acting positions. For starters, Al Diaco was given the acting boss position. It turns out that didn't last too long. While the bosses were in hiding, paranoia settled in and they trusted no one. Several members were falsely labeled as rats. For one, Bruno Facciola was killed over this false wire. Pete Chioto was shot several times as a result of this false label, but he survived and began cooperating. The bosses also had suspicions that the money that was being kicked up was short. Meanwhile, they collected over a million dollars the time they spent as fugitives. During this time, besides Diaco being the acting boss, Anthony Boat Barada was the acting underboss, and Stevie Cree was the acting consigliere. But in time, Vic and Gaspipe would take all the acting positions away and create a panel which consisted of members making day-to-day -day decisions jointly. The panel members would meet in an apartment right around the corner from Rayo's in East Harlem. Although the panel was handling day-to-day -day operations smoothly, there was a disconnect. And this came from the members that were picked to be messengers. Patty Testa was one, and he was Vic's guy. And Georgie Nex Zapola, which was the other, and he was a gas pipe ally. Another major problem taking place was gas pipes insubordination. Without Vic's knowledge, he was making decisions and was attempting to control the family through his people. The panel would be changed many times, adding to all the chaos. It first consisted of Al Diaco, Frankie Lasterino, and Anthony Boat. In time, Frankie Lasterino would be placed back in an acting consigliere position. This is despite the Lucchese bosses announcing that there would be no more acting positions. Sal Avellino would join the panel as well. Stevie Crea, who was taken down from his acting consigliere position, would at some point join the panel too. Like Stevie, when Al Diaco lost his position, he was not happy about it. So he set up an appointment with Stevie in order to feel him out. He spoke to him about making a move to take over the family. He asked Stevie if he could take Boat out. Stevie replied like that by snapping his fingers. There was a known animosity that Stevie had for Boat. Overall, this power move never took place due to the events that unfolded. The arrest of Vic Musso on July 28, 1991, had several aftershocks within the family. First and foremost, paranoia was at an all-time high. Let's not forget, now Gaspipe was officially calling the shots. Immediately, Al Diaco was labeled a rat, an accusation that was untrue. Members of the family attempted to hit him at a meeting on September 18, 1991, at the Kimberley Hotel in Manhattan. Luckily for Diaco, he managed to escape unharmed, which led him right into the arms of the government to begin cooperating. The panel was now reorganized, its members being Frankie Lasterino, Anthony Boat, Sal Avellino, and Stevie Crea. Not only did the panel have to deal with day-to-day -day operations, but now they had to be concerned about what Al Diaco was divulging to the FBI. 
Gas Pipe still remained at large, and little did anyone know that he played a role in the capture of Vic Amuso. I guess he figured with Vic out of the way, he could make all the decisions and get a bigger piece of the pie. Paranoia struck the Lucchese family again. From prison, Vic relayed that he had a concern over Neil Migliori, who was a Bronx faction captain. The concern was that Neil, being an influential captain, would try to make a move to take over the family. So on April 3rd, 1992, while Neil was sitting in a Long Island restaurant, an attempt was made on his life. And like Chioda, he also survived. Gaspipe's days of running the family as a fugitive came to an end on January 19th, 1993. While trying to locate Gaspipe, the FBI began keeping closer tabs on Frankie Lasterino's phone. They began to notice a pattern of phone calls from Lasterino's phone to a phone that was bouncing off a phone tower in Mount Olive, New Jersey. With this information, they were able to zero in on Gaspipe's location. When he was arrested, one of the items found in his possession was FBI files of the profit sessions of Al Diaco and Pete Chioda, which naturally was of great concern to the FBI. Also in his possession was detailed notes regarding payments and names of members of the family, among other things. Speaking of payments, I remember Thomas D'Ambrosio telling me he walked on eggshells anytime he was sent to deliver money to Gaspipe. At the time, Thomas was a member of Boat's crew. After Gaspipe's arrest, the panel was reorganized again. Stevie Crea, Joe Defiti, and Danny Cateo were added to it. During this time, indictments were looming and the Brooklyn faction had a new concern, Stevie Crea. Besides him being a Bronx faction captain, he now also sat on the panel. Also, the fact that he was disgruntled over losing his position proved to them his thirst for control. So the Brooklyn faction, in particular, Frankie Lasterino, Georgie Nexabola, Georgie Conti, and Frankie Bones Papani all conspired to hit Stevie. His only saving grace was the boatload of Lucchese indictments that came down before they could carry it out. Had this stroke of luck had not taken place, he was most definitely going. I've spoken many times in the past about the distaste that the Brooklyn faction has for the Bronx. Nevertheless, when the dust settled, strangely enough, Vicar Musso picked Stevie Crea as the acting boss and later the official underboss of the Lucchese family. During my time, the family's base of power was in the Bronx, as the Brooklyn faction before me feared. By early 2016, two top administration positions were vacant. One belonging to the acting boss, Matty Madonna, and the other, Joe DiNapoli, the consigliere, thus leaving Stevie Crea the underboss to run the family. Important to note, during this time, Stevie Crea made no attempt to reach out to Vic for his guidance. A year later, word on the street was that a new Lucchese indictment was coming down. During this time, past and present Brooklyn faction members no longer wanted to see the base of power in the Bronx. I've spoken about this in a previous video, and I'll put that video's link in the description down below. In short, a letter was sent out by Vicar Musso approving certain members of the Brooklyn faction to fill these voided positions. Many people mistakenly think that the mob was only about violence. In some cases, this can be true. However, many situations are handled with diplomacy. I've said in the past, violence is always plan B, with diplomacy being plan A. And in this case, had Stevie not taken heed to diplomacy, he was target number one. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, you could do that as well. By doing so, you'll receive alerts whenever I post a new video. I also want to give a quick thanks to all of you who have recommended this channel to family and friends. The subscriber count has been increasing daily. And for this, I thank you. Okay, enjoy your day. Until the next time. You can subscribe to the Sit Down News blog at sitdownnews.com. And I appreciate everyone who has subscribed. Thank you. Well, just another example in the mob you never knew about. If you would like to subscribe to this channel, you can do so down below. If you would like to subscribe to my other channel, Unlimited Substance Podcast, I'll add a link in the description to this video.